All right, welcome everybody to week four, day three. I think I called it week three earlier in the week. It's week four. Yeah, I do. I do like this wallpaper engine background. So, if you guys don't know what wallpaper engine is, it is. Uh, uh, let's see here. This thing it's available on Steam, and it allows you to uh, have cool animated backgrounds and stuff like that. And they got they're all free. Uh, I think. Wallpaper Engine itself costs a little bit of money, but it goes on sale for like, I don't know, a couple bucks or something. Two bucks, five bucks, something like that. It's pretty good. It's really nice. So, uh, you heard very questionable things on it. I mean, people do make anime backgrounds for it, so, you know, it's fair. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, definitely consider Wallpaper Engine. I feel bad m dropping money on it, I guess. I mean... Given the amount of enjoyment I've gotten out of Wallpaper Engine, like I feel like I've gotten my $3 worth or whatever it was I spent on it. <sighs> All right, so we are going to talk today about ethics. Uh, this is um, one of the important and recurring themes in this class. Uh, and again, sorry for the construction going on outside. I don't know if they're blowing an air horn or something. Uh, okay, so... But yeah, and you can make your own backgrounds for it. So we're going to talk about ethics. And so a lot of computer science people um, go through their whole computer science careers without learning ethics. And um, maybe that's how we got Facebook. <laughs> I kid, I kid. But it's true. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's important to at least have a, a conversational familiarity with different ethical systems and like what it means to be right and wrong. So you can at least think about it, right? You can at least um, decide, you know what, this is kind of bad, but uh, I want to get paid, you know, <laughs> chairman of the board meme, you know what I mean, Vince McMahon. So, um, yeah, for example, a student of mine, former student of mine, applied to do uh, data science. Data science, uh, we can talk about some other time. It's pretty cool though. He applied for a data science position and um, the job interview question was, how would you go about um, essentially violating the privacy of every American so that you could advertise to them better? It, they didn't phrase it quite that way, but that's what it worked out to. It was like, you know, using databases, how would you, you know, and uh, none of the, you know, I, I can only assume that if you wrote down, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't violate the privacy of every American given the chance. I can only imagine if, that if he wrote that, he would not get the job, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about ethics today. Let's, let's just check on the quiz. I have a feeling... You guys did better on this, but let's see if my, my feeling is correct. Feelings are not evidence, depending on your ethical system or something. I don't know. All right, so four, five. Let's see how you did on the quiz. Da, 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 quiz statistics. Yes, the extra credit. That is right. There is a, uh, yeah, okay, much, much better. Almost at 70%, which is usually when I'm satisfied that students are, like, dialed in on something. All right, so uh, if I eat a protein pancake from batter up my stomach hurts, I don't know why I keep doing this to myself, too. It's like a GTA San Andreas meme. Ah, oh, here we go again, you know. I like their pa protein pancakes, though. So, uh, when I forget to change the second question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if I eat a protein pancake, my stomach hurts. Part, uh, premise two, my stomach hurts. Conclusion, I ate a protein pancake. Um, yeah, my stomach could hurt for other reasons. Right, this is an ongoing and, and recurring uh, thing I keep pointing out. If X then Y does not mean that if X, if and only if X then Y, right? There's There could be a lot of things that cause Y. For example, I could eat a rock and that would cause my stomach to hurt. I could um, drink uh, ice water too fast. That could cause my stomach to hurt, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, um, this, this is not good reasoning and um, 
And those of you that said modus ponens, uh, you're looking at the form here. If x, then y. It's supposed to be x, then y. It's backwards. Okay, if it's backwards, it's affirming the consequent. Okay, if x, then y, y, x, that's a fallacy called affirming the consequent. And most of you guys got it, so that's good. Okay, and then for this one, if I drink coffee, I will be awake. If x, then y. I did not drink coffee not x, therefore not y. No. Again, that doesn't follow. Like, if I drink coffee, I'll be awake. Okay, sure, I guess, maybe. Um, but people can just be awake from, like, having slept enough, right? This is clearly a fallacy, right? Um, even if we grant both of these premises, even if we grant that drinking coffee makes you awake, which it may or may not do, it depends your caffeine tolerance, even if we grant both of these premises, it does not follow. And that's the whole thing about a deductive argument. A deductive argument, a valid deductive argument, is one in which if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. Okay. But I could just have gotten a good night's sleep. All right? You know, I didn't say anything about what would happen if I don't drink coffee. So... Uh, this is a denying the antecedent fallacy. Okay. If x can be false in modus ponens, in modus ponens, um, you're asserting that x is true. A modus ponens argument says if x, then y, and then x is true, therefore y is true. For modus tollens, you assert x implies y, you assert y is not true, therefore x is not true. So this is most definitely a fallacy. Some of you got the wrong fallacy putting up at 66%, but still a good 34% of you picked it was a valid form of argumentation, which it is not. Okay. So, ethics. So, what does it mean for something to be right? What does it mean for something to be wrong, morally speaking? Okay. What does it mean for something to be good? What does it mean for something to be evil? What do you think? Toss some ideas out there on chat. I'll write them down. Literally, it depends. <laughs> All right, I'm not gonna write it depends down. What is what is right? What is wrong? What defines right and wrong? You got your ankles taken by these quizzes. It's all all opinion. Okay, all right. So, motivism or non cognitivism? Uh, there is no good and evil uh, there is just emotion right so uh, why is cannibalism evil because I think it's disgusting right seems yeah ew, somebody's eating somebody you so emotivism is the view that there is no actual such thing as good and evil there's just people's opinions on the matter and mostly they're just, uh, uh, they're just, uh, emotion reaction based, you know? Okay. Good or evil is based on human. Yes. Cool. This is called divine command theory. And that is, uh, basically religion defines good and evil. For example, the Ten Commandments, right? For example. Uh, there's obviously many, many religions and many different rules. But basically, yeah, that's a very common view, if not one of the, the most common, uh, which is that, you know, if God says that, um, if God says that stealing is bad, then stealing is bad. Right? Right? Um, Alright, what else? What else could define good and evil? Why is... Why is murder bad? That's something we all agree is bad. Right, murder seems bad. Why is murder bad? 
for divine command theorists, well, it's right there in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit murder. Uh, the one quote, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Murder's bad because you're taking a human life. Okay, well, why is taking a human life bad? What is the uh, what is the principle you're trying to you're trying to put out there? Human life is sacred, something like that. People have the right to live, something like that. What do you think? Are you doing this in your philosophy class? Good. Then you can contribute. What makes things good and evil? Barba. It makes you more likely to kill others. Uh, yeah. You wouldn't want somebody to kill you, so it's not okay to kill others. Okay, so like some sort of like uh, reciprocity, something like that. You know, maybe combined with a little bit of empathy, maybe. Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't like uh, to be punched in the face, so I'm not going to punch somebody in the face. Okay. Golden rule. It's immoral to cause pain. Okay. All right. Sure. All right. So it is immoral. Uh, yeah, let's just let's just say uh, pain is evil. Is that fair, Barba? Am I? Uh, pain is evil. Is that fair? Why not? Okay. And then what is good? Pleasure is good. Yeah. All right. Well, in that case, if that's true, then I couldn't give you guys any more of my quizzes, right? It would be immoral for me to cause pain. So no more, no more quizzes for the rest of the uh, semester, because it causes uh, anguish, and despair, gnashing of teeth. <laughs> or I could just be like, "Yo, it's evil. I don't care. I'm doing it anyway." <laughs> How about this? How about this? Even though it causes you pain, it gives me pleasure to have students Googling whether or not Air Bud served in Congress. I actually post that on my Facebook page. Like, I got my students right now, like, searching whether or not a golden retriever ever served in the U.S. Congress. <laughs> so, you know, so how do you, how do you balance that, Barbara? If pain is evil and pleasure is good, what's the, what's the trade-off there? Me inflicting anguish on my students with my Air Bud quiz question gave me a lot of pleasure, but uh, I don't know. I got there's more students. It's like a hundred of you, and there's one of me. The pain of all your students outweighs your pleasure. I don't know. What if I just like really enjoyed it? What if I thought it was just like super funny? It's a good question. Philosophy is just questions that never get answered. <laughs> Teacher being the psychopath, yeah, but it's uh, but it's a serious objection, right? Because this uh, this philosophy here is called moral hedonism, which is a form of utilitarianism. Okay, and uh, there is a common objection to utilitarianism that says, "All right, well, if all you're doing is weighing pain on one side and pleasure on the other." Then if somebody gets a lot of pleasure out of like torturing somebody, then it's good according to utilitarianism, right? Uh, the Romans uh, used to uh, do horrible things in the arena, right? Um, like we've all heard about them, like feeding Christians to the lions and things like that. But have you heard about the uh, the fat woman versus the dwarf fights? That's what they called them. They thought it was the height of comedy. To have a fat woman fight a dwarf. The dwarf having a giant club with nails on it. And the dwarf would bludgeon her to death so she would slowly bleed out. And the Romans thought it was absolutely freaking hilarious. And they would pay good money to watch a fat woman and a dwarf fight themselves to death. Just two people having pain. 30,000 people in the audience getting a riotously good time. You never heard of this one, but it's evil. No, it's not evil. If you're a utilitarian, as uh, utilitarian, that's a good. That was a morally good thing because it provided a lot of pleasure to the thirty thousand people in the audience. And who knows? Maybe they went home and told their their friends about how uh, 
uh, what kind of funny noises the dwarf made as the woman bludgeoned him over the head. Yeah, if you're if you're going to try and say it's evil, then you need a different moral system, because according to utilitarianism, depending on the form of utilitarianism, um, that would be a morally good action. Right? It's not like math where we can measure something. Actually, uh, Jeremy Bentham, who was the uh, Jeremy Bentham, who was the founder of utilitarianism, he been in moral hedonism. Uh, he actually would disagree with you, uh, Brian. Uh, he actually believed this made ethics the same thing as math. Because what you do is you add up all the pleasure, pleasure, and you subtract out all the pain, and that tells you if it's moral or not. If there is a net pleasure, it's a moral activity. If there's net pain, it's an immoral activity. It's an evil activity. So he actually, he, he believed that you could do something called the philosophic, philosophic, philosophic calculus, which is this. He believed that you could actually kind of sit down and uh, mathematically figure out if something is good or bad by weighing how many people are experiencing the pain or pleasure and how much you just kind of add them together subtract out the pain and that'll give you this this is 70 units of good you know or whatever or this is 20 units of evil you know what i mean if the goods outweigh the bad it should be considered while the bad outweighs the good it should not be considered yeah mm -hmm. that that's what he called the philosophic calculus so basically you can sit down with a pencil and piece of paper and do the math and figure out, okay, yes, that is slightly good, or that is very good, or that is slightly evil, or that's very evil. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's utilitarianism. So that is, that is one of the major systems of ethical thought that you need to learn. Okay. That's one of your things you need to learn. Uh, divine command theory is let's start off purple. Divine command theory is another one. Let's color that in. All right. What else is there? What other systems of ethics are there? What about Mike makes right? Hmm. I heard that one before. So there's something called the Melian uh, Dialogue. Uh, Athens um, was involved in this big conflict with Sparta um, back in the day. Not recently. Don't get excited. And uh, both Athens and Sparta had allies. And Sparta basically always beat up the Athenians on land, the Athenians always beat up the Spartans on sea, and so it formed this sort of long-running stalemate. But the Spartans had a ally on the island of Melios. Milo? Milos? Yes. I can spell that. It's Milos. Yeah. And... Um, And they besieged the city because uh, Milos is an island. And so, you know, Spartans couldn't get there to help him. All right. So the uh, Venus of the Venus of Milo, right? You, you've all seen this one, right? Uh, apologies if any of you have sensitive, um, you know, brains. So... The Athenians besiege it, and they're like, "Look, you're gonna you're gonna lose, right? Like you're, you've got no hope. Spartans aren't coming for you. Um, your 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 city's toast. If you fight us, you're gonna lose, and we're gonna kill every every one of you. And those we don't kill are gonna be enslaved. So just surrender to us. If you surrender to us, we'll go easy on you. 
And um, the Melian said, no, we, we made a promise to Sparta to fight you, and we're going to we're gonna fight you. And the Athenians are like, look, you're, it's, it's just a dumb... It's just a dumb move on your part. And they're like, look, you know, uh, you tell us why you're attacking us. What justification do you have for beating up a small little, you know, city on, you know, on an island? And the Athenians are like, well, you know, we're stronger than you. <laughs> you know, like we got a navy, uh, we got soldiers, you don't. Um, we're at war, so it's the natural way of things for the strong to beat up the, the weak. You know, and we're just trying to we're just trying to go easy on you here, you know, and um, and so that that was preserved in something called the Melian uh, dialogue, and you know, basically, you know, the the principle outlined by the Athenians is like, yeah, we're bigger than you, we're gonna beat you up, you know, we're gonna take your stuff, you know, trust me, bro, <laughs> right? So, you know, why is uh? Why do a lot of countries do what they do? You know? Alright. So, that's one. Okay. Um, another one is called... Oh, there's a school of thought. There's a school of thought called consequentialism, which is kind of same thing as this, where like um, the outcomes determine if it is good or bad, right? So it doesn't matter that you're trying to save the person's life, you know, there's a car accident, and you try to save the person, but because they had a spinal injury, you killed them, right? To a consequentialist, you did an evil deed. Right, it doesn't matter what your intention was. The yeah, outcome. Okay. Utilitarianism is a is one of various consequentialist uh, ethics. So maybe I shouldn't give it its own number, but whatever, I'm fine with it. And then the opposite of consequentialism is what's called uh, deontology. Uh, that means duty. So a deontologist would say, no, look, the person was trying to save the guy's life. He wasn't. A, he wasn't a doctor person, but, you know, he was doing it, you know, his, his intentions were right. So deontology is like your intentions determine if something is good or bad. Do you guys see the difference between these two? Make sense? Not a means, uh, uh, not, uh, quite, quite, quite an opposite to the means to the end. It's not the means to the end that matters. It's, it, well, sorry. It is. Let's put it this way. It, it is the means that matter, not the ends. That's that's a better way of putting that. Okay. Yeah. So if um, um, let's say that um, you're at uh, Knott's Berry Farm, riding on the train there, and this guy pulls out a gun. And he's like, everybody get out your wallets. This is a stick up. And you like pull out your gun and kill him. Then because you thought like he's a robber, but he was actually an actor. A consequentialist would be like, that's murder, bro. Cool, cool motive. Still murder. The deontologist is like, look, he was, he thought it was an actual robbery and he shot the guy. Right. You guys, do you guys see the difference between these two? What about prank? No, it was a thing. Like, like when I was when I went to Knott's Berry Farm as a you know six year old or something, that's what they did. They, there's a train that goes around the park, and and these robbers like come in. And they're like, "This is a stick up," and I I started freaking out. My grandfather was just like, "Oh, don't move," you know, just give them what they want. It, he, I mean, he knew that it was a robbery, but you know, he was just messing with me. I'm like, "No, we we got to do something. We got to call the police," you know. <clears throat> you know, I, I I need to run up to the conductor, and he's like, "No, no, just sit down," you know. And, um, and I don't know if they still, the last time I went there was a year ago and the train was down. So I, I don't know if they're still robbing people, you know, quote unquote robbing people. But, um, I went on a few times and they, and they rob it, you know, over and over again and kids freak out, you know, and stuff like that. So, 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. You know, the intention is that they're going to give people a story to tell. Like I, I obviously remembered it from when I was six. You know, um, the outcomes. I don't know. I, I'm. <laughs> it just seems risky to just draw a gun on on a train full of people. You know, it's not like you, it's not like you go through a metal detector to get into Knott's Berry Farm. You know what I mean? Like some people are going to be packing. So. Um, I come back in here with people robbing the train. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's just a pair of actors and they just rob the train over and over again. So, um, so what form of deontology is the most uh, famous? There is... Do, 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 Kant. A guy by the name of Kant. Manuel Kant made something called the categorical imperative. And this you will need to know. So what is the categorical imperative? Categorical imperative is as follows. He says he is a deontologist. He is the most famous deontologist. What matters is your intention. And um, when are we getting our stuff back? Yeah. When it's a joke and then actual robbers come. No, no, seriously, give me your wallet. <laughs> Somebody calls the police. Help! I'm being robbed on the Knott's Berry Farm train. Oh, l l lady, it's just a, it's just a show. You're not being robbed. No, no, they took my purse. Uh, lady, they'll give it. That that would be that's a big brain move for robbers right there. Okay. Uh, before we get started, oh yeah, does anyone want to get off? <laughs> nice. Yeah. So the category of imperative, cat, the CI, it's called sometimes the CI, Kantian ethics, um, is act as if everyone I'm dumbing it down a little bit but, uh, act as if everyone would do what you do okay so uh, if your mom ever told you hey if your friends jumped off a cliff would you jump off a cliff too um, you know, uh, she's sort of invoking like, uh, the categorical imper imperative, like you, you need to pick actions that if everybody did it, then the world would be a better place. I'd be the first one jumping. Yeah. Depends if there's water under it. That's also a good point. Um, so, uh, I'll jump. Um, <laughs> uh, but do you understand? So like, uh, murder is bad because if you, imagine if everybody murdered, right? Like, we're just like, all right, it's uh, The Purge, right? You know, there's a documentary on this called The Purge where, uh, or The Lottery, The Purge. Purge? The Purge. I think they made a remake of it recently. Um Films present a normal crime-free America. However, uh, on a, uh, once once a year, there is Purge Day, where all crime, including murder, is legal for a twelve-hour period. So, yeah, yeah. So, um, America becomes virtually crime-free. Yeah. Okay. So, the Purge. Yeah. And and so, the. Uh, <laughs> Um, the notion is like, what if everybody just went out and murdered somebody right now? Would the world be a better place or a worse place? What do you think? I mean, that's Thanos's take, right? I'm just going to kill half the people in the universe, right? Thanos staff. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, yeah. Or, you know, what if, uh, what if everybody stole, right? Like just every day you just like walk into a neighbor's house and just like take their bass guitar or something like would that make the world a better place or worse place and some people might argue well you know you'll get distribution of income you know it'll sort of even out if everybody stole i don't know um i most people would argue it'd be worse what if everybody lied constantly what if what if what if i told you that i'd give all of you a's in this class
Yeah, all your hard, 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 hard work hours. You'd be happy. Yeah. And then I'm like, psych! At the end of the semester, right? Nobody does any of the quizzes. Why am I going to take the midterm? The professor told me I'm getting an A no matter what I do. And then the, the grades come in, F. Like, what? Like, <laughs> right? Uh, it would, like, how would, how would society function? How would society function if everybody lied to each other constantly? You couldn't trust anything anybody said. How would you, like, you know, you go to the bank and, and you're like, I'd like to make a deposit. Okay, sure, I'm the teller. <laughs> Hand them money they put in their pocket and walk out. You know, like, uh, <laughs> right? Like, that's, um, that's Kant's point, is that um, act as if your actions were universals, right? Act as if whenever you make a moral decision, should I lie, should I not lie, should I murder, should I not murder, just think about what would happen if everybody made the same decision you did, right? You don't get to make a special exception for yourself. Well, they can't murder, but I can, right? Or like with the pandemic, everyone else should wear their masks, but I shouldn't, <laughs> right? Everyone else should stay at home, let the pandemic go away, but I still want to go out and, and go to a party, right? No, you can't do that. Under Kantian ethics, it has to be universal, okay? It is, it, you know... Uh, moral, you know, universal, universal actions, right? That's written very horribly in the interview right now. Right? So if you go out to a party during a pandemic, imagine what would happen if everyone did. Would the pandemic get better or would it get worse? Right? So, uh, thief, a criminal, menace to the entire city. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. So Kant's that, that, this is the whole basis of Kantian ethics. Like, just think of, you know, just think it through, right? Like, uh, I don't know. Should I, um, you know, should I give up driving my car? Like, that's a tougher question, right? What if everybody stopped driving cars? I don't know. I don't know. That's a tough one, right? Would society break down? You know, like how do you take your kids to school if they're like four or five miles away? You'd have to walk them four or five miles. I mean, I guess you can do your work online now, but like, you know, a lot of people live in areas where you can't even walk, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, here in Fresno, it's not too bad, but like there are parts of LA where um, yeah, if you don't have a car, you're, you're hosed, you know, there's, I'm in sidewalks, like where, where my, uh, uh, extended family lives in LA, like they don't even have sidewalks. You're walking on the street. If you're walking somewhere, the nearest grocery store is like not even, I, I, you know, if you like walking, I guess you could walk to a grocery store. <laughs> no cars, less pollution. Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's the thing. That's what makes that's what makes Kantian ethics like complicated. It's like, all right, well, is driving a, a car moral or immoral? And it's it's tough, you know. It's not it's not like it's not like there's an easy answer to it. You know, global warming, right? Pollution, right? Um, you know, all the issues with political issues with gasoline and OPEC and all that stuff. Like, it's a tough it's a tough question. You know, uh, t just teleport. Yeah, streets become walk streets. Yeah, that's true. Like, they would, you know, people would probably redo the streets and there would probably be more, more mass transit. I mean, uh, there are definitely cities in Europe where there's no cars in them, right? So, they're smaller than LA. Like, LA, like, I don't know if you know this, but like, LA is a large city. Well, not even a city. It's like the, the LA metropolitan area. Um, Like a lot, of, a lot of people have trouble comprehending just how large it is. Um, uh, 18 million people and uh, encompasses five counties, right? Goes out through San Bernardino out to the east, right? Like if you were to take this map, in fact, let's do this maps.google.com. Alright, uh, 
20 kilometers. Okay, so it goes from about, goes from about yay to about yay. There. Okay. Now let's put this over England. This is the same scale as that map I showed you before. Okay. Ventura, San Bernardino. Ventura would be over here. San Bernardino would be over here. So if you zoom out of uh, the UK, the Los Angeles metropolitan area is like about this big. Right? Like, and, th and this is something that, um, yeah. Yeah, measure it out. Measured out. Uh, Texas is the size of France, more or less, right? Like Europeans in particular, they're like, just make your city a walking city. It's like, all right, would you walk from London to Bristol? No. Okay. <laughs> London's where I live. Bristol's downtown LA. That's where I work. Would you? No. Would you bike it? No. Like, <laughs> like you don't comprehend how <laughs> far apart. You know where my where my in laws live, with with where uh, my my brother in law works. He you know that's a long drive, you know every day through L A traffic, right? Um, and it's like this is just like the the countryside, you know. Like by the time you get over here, it's just like you know it's just green, you know. It's like nice and there's farms and stuff like that. Stanford Dingley and Marlston Hermitage, like all these quaint little towns and Oxfords around here somewhere. Yeah, Oxfords. It's a nice little cute little town. Like, you don't understand. Like, it's, you know, it, it's, it, it's, so like, if you're discussing like this with, with your friends in Europe, especially, they're like, yeah, just get rid of cars. Like, just make the, make the town a walkable town. <laughs> and it's, it's because, you know, and this is something we'll talk about a lot this semester. You'll hear me repeat a lot this semester. It's like, you have these sort of like, um, subconscious beliefs, right? Like the way that things are around you are the way that things are around the world, right? Like you can walk across Rome. I've done it before. Like all the histor you know, the historical parts of Rome, you know, I used to spend a day and I just walked to each of them. Not a big deal. They're, you know, it was built during Roman times and the Romans walked everywhere. And so it's, you know, there it's, it was a lot of walking, but you can do all of Rome in a day, just walking around, you know? And um, London too, like you just walk up and down the Thames and you can see Big Ben and the Tower of London and all that stuff. And it's actually really not very far, you know? Um, and then they're like, oh yeah, just walk to Bristol. <laughs> walk to Manchester. Like, no, like, you know, it's because they're used to towns being a certain way and organized a certain way. And so when they say, well, you should do this, they don't understand it. It's very different in different parts of the world or can be. I wish there was sidewalks. Yeah, I do too. It, it makes me very awkward when I'm like walking around LA on the road, right? <laughs> I don't trust LA drivers and I'm just like, I'm going to go out and get my exercise. Hope I don't die. All right. So, um, yeah, yeah. And California itself is a very diverse state. California is the size of Japan, by the way. So like, you know, if, to put that in perspective, um, so like California, like if you superimpose California, it's on top of Honshu, basically. So, um, you know, think about all the times I've been to Japan as a tourist. It's like, could I squeeze that much tourism out of California? You know, like I, I like California. I've been to all across California, but like I don't think I could spend as much time as I spend in Japan because it's just closer. You know, if California had the train stretch of Japan, it'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it would. It'd be cool if that high-speed rail ever got built. <laughs> I don't know how long they've been working on that thing. Anyway. Okay, so do you guys understand con... So, like, if you're going to talk about something, like, for things like murder and theft and, and lying, like, yeah, those are pretty easy to determine things. For things like cars, it gets complicated, right? And it depends which part of the world you're in, and that isn't a universal either, so... Yeah, so... Yeah, I can't. I can't wait to take the high-speed rail 
between Madeira and, and Bakersfield. That's exciting. I, I travel to <laughs> Merced and Bakersfield every day. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, nah, but seriously, if they ever got high-speed rail like to San Diego, that would be nice. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really nice. Okay, so uh, that's that. There's that. There's that. Uh, another big one is the uh, natural rights. So this is something else you need to know and will be on the quiz. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. What's that from? <clears throat> you don't know? So the United States government, even though the, De the Declaration of Independence is not like an official law, it is still actually used by judges and things like that as the foundational document of our country. Um, and what it espouses is what's called natural rights doctrine or natural rights theory of morality. So <clears throat> let me read it to you. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among them the powers of the earth, the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impelled them to the separation. So this document is saying why they are separating from England, from Great Britain. Okay. Boom. Here we go. We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, they're not defending them. They're just premises, right? Like we just, it's self-evidently true that all men are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay? We have certain unalienable rights. These rights can be violated by governments, but they cannot be voided by governments. They're not granted by governments. Governments do not give you the right to life. You have the right to life inherently as a human. You have the right to life. You have the right to liberty. And you have the right to the pursuit of happiness, which is an interesting turn of phrase because John Locke said it's life, liberty, and property. Uh, Jefferson wanted it to be uh, more broad than just property. So he changed it to the pursuit of happiness, which includes like owning a house and things like that. But also um, like if you want to go to college, you know, and things like that. Okay. That to, so that to secure these rights. So again, rights. Okay. Governments are instituted among men. So the purpose of a government, according to TJ, is that uh, governments are there to protect the rights. They're not there to violate the rights. They're there to protect the rights. That's why people form governments. Because without them, then uh, hooligans can walk over and smash your skull in and violate your right to life. And so government will provide the order and security um, that you would not have in, in an anarchy. Right to happiness, college and debt, allow me to introduce myself. Yeah. Well, it's a decision. <laughs> um, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, in other words, any time a government is violating your rights, it is the right, again, the right of people, to alter or abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So that is the reason for the American Revolution. They felt that their rights as British citizens were being violated. Uh, uh, British has a common law tradition dating back a long, long time. Um, some people say the Magna Carta um, is the source of all these sort of natural rights and things like that. Um, it's arguable to what extent that's true. The Magna Carta was... Um, it, it, you should read it sometime. It's not what you think. <laughs> Like, you think it's like, oh, it guarantees the right to a, a jury trial and stuff like that. It, it, it's interesting. Magna Carta is an interesting document. 
if a, if a person dies and their heir is too young, then it, then somebody needs to watch over them, and that person can't steal their estate, but they can still take from the estate just to pay for their own costs, but not like it, it's it's very um, in the weeds kind of as far as like what rights you know you have as a as a British baron really. So that's that's the uh, natural rights theory that humanity humanity has rights to life, liberty, and property, or the pursuit of happiness, which was a movie, I think, a few years back. Right? Um, so Locke said life, liberty, and property. Jefferson said pursuit of happiness. Okay. And so what is moral? What is moral? What is moral is that which protects those rights. Right? What is immoral? What is evil? That which violates those rights. Right? So murder is evil because it violates the right to life. So many different moral ideas. I know. It's fun, isn't it? <laughs> and you're going to need to know them. You're going to you're going to have to be at least conversant enough with these different moral theories to recognize when somebody's using one of them. Okay? So in total there's nine moral ideas. No, oh, no, no, no. There's way more than that. But the ones that uh, <laughs> the ones that you're going to need to know are the ones that are highlighted with rainbow colors. Okay? Divine command theory, why is murder wrong? God said so. Right? Thou shall not commit murder. A lot of people translate that incorrectly as thou shall not kill. It's a bad translation. Um, quite quite clearly, killing is okay in cases like war and, and things like that. Um, the uh, thou shall not kill was from the King James Bible, which was four centuries ago. Um, the, the proper translation is thou shall not murder. And, um, so, or without, yeah, basically. So, um, yeah. So why is Mordor evil? God, why is murder evil? God said so. I said, why is Mordor evil? Mordor is also evil. And you can't just walk to it. Um, <laughs> why is theft evil? God said so. Simple. Divine, like, you know, it doesn't require much explanation, right? What about, um, I don't know. Internet, uh, what about social media? What, I don't know. What does divine command theory have to say about Facebook? <laughs> All right. Then it gets tricky. But for simple things, like, you know, it's pretty good. Um, utilitarianism, specifically moral hedonism, is the notion that you use pain and pleasure as the benchmark for good and evil. If you uh, slap somebody, psh, that's evil because you inflicted pain on them, right? Um, unless they enjoyed it, I guess. Then you did a good action. But it, you, you might even thought, I'm going to hurt this person. You slap them, they're like, oh, yeah, that was nice. Do it again. You're like, okay, I did good by accident. My bad. <laughs> um, did I say murder or moral? Is the, I said Mordor, Mordor. Uh, sorry. I mispronounced murder as Mordor. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know what Mordor is, it is the land of Sauron. Sauron, the people are hurriedly taking down notes. <laughs> the, the bad guy in Lord of the Rings. Okay. Now, murder is bad. Murder is bad because God said murder is bad. Utilitarianism, murder is bad because you're inflicting pain. Not just on the person you're killing, but on the people who love the person that died. All right? So, um, that's why murder is bad. What if you're murdering a bad person and everyone's like, yay, you killed the child molester. Then is it bad? I don't know. Do the philosophic calculus. Add it up. How much did people enjoy watching the, the pedophile get killed versus um, the pain that was inflicted upon him? Right? So, uh, it, it, it does get... Cal it, it, the, 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 the calculus does get complicated. Okay? Um... And then uh, the, categor the categorical imperative, murder is wrong because if everyone did it, there'd be no one left, <laughs> right? Or you'd get these horrible dystopian, um, 
you know, civilizations where everyone's just gunning each other down left and right. Total anarchy. It's not, not fun. It's not cool. You wouldn't want to live there, you know? So, uh, and then finally, natural rights. Murder is wrong because you're violating somebody's right to life. You know, the rights can be violated. It, it's just wrong to do so. And, and what's, what's really important, what differentiates natural rights from other conceptions of rights is that a lot of people think that rights are conferred by society. Right? Right? Pun. A lot of people think you get your right to free speech from the government. The government gives you the right to free speech. You know, and they can take it away. So... Um, that's a very fundamentally, that's a seriously fundamentally different view than natural rights. Natural rights, like, no, 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 I have the right to free speech and you can violate it, you know, by not allowing me to publish my editorial or something, you know, in the newspaper, but you can't take it away. There's, there's a really important, yeah, you know, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? That is the basis of the ethical system of the United States. So, um, uh, so if the government said you can't write an editorial about why every student should take critical thinking, um, that would be violating my right to liberty. I have the right as a free citizen of the American, because I'm a human, really, because I'm a human, I have the right to speak my mind, right? And the government's violating it. And TJ's point uh, Thomas Jefferson's point was that uh, if the government start really going hog wild, violating people's rights left and right, then it's your duty as a free citizen to overthrow the government and put a new one in that will respect your rights. That's the basis of government and the basis of morality in that worldview. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's natural rights. You know, what rights can be violated, but they cannot be taken away. The only way that you could vi the only way that you could forfeit your right to life is by murdering somebody else, right? So if you're in a situation where a person's pulled out a gun, it's not not Sperry Farm, but they're actually about to murder somebody, then you, you have the right to take out your gun and shoot them because they're violating somebody else's right. So and so in doing, they have forfeited their natural right to life. It's the moral thing to do to protect the innocent. Okay, so. Uh, that and and there's uh, um, the principle of double effect and things like that that we can talk about next time, but that's the general gist. So I'm going to put up a quiz on these four these four things highlighted in, in rainbow. Do you guys have any questions about any of them? Like what the difference is between them? God said so. Pleasure and pain. We weigh them. Free utilitarianism. Categorical imperative. Act as if your thing is a universal. And natural rights, you have inherent rights as a human being. You have inherent dignity as a human being. Um, and there's other rights as well. Privacy, for example, is a commonly cited one. Only the rainbow ones, yeah. There's going to be four questions on the quiz. Maybe I'll even do matching. Just match. Match them up. Okay. Any questions about it? You got them? And this is important because we're going to be talking a lot about ethics in this class because computer science has a big impact on the world. And so having at least a conversant understanding of the major ethical systems, really important. Watch them make all the answers from one moral idea. <laughs> no, I'll do matching. I'll do matching so that you just pick the one-to-one. -one. Okay. Any questions? We'll find out on Monday. <laughs> now, I'll, 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 yeah, let's match it. It's the easiest I can do it. Okay, all right. Sounds good, everyone. Uh, peace out. Have a good weekend. Sleep well. Get lots of rest. And uh, uh, I think there's a Zybox or not. I don't know, but um, there there will be a, just a quiz. I think for Monday. Okay. All right. See y'all.